Uh, my name is Will Marple. I am a full stack web developer at an agency in Woodstock called Black Airplane. And uh, I specialize in PHP, Laravel, and MySQL in the back end. I have experience with Angular, React, and prefer and love Vue in the front end. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here to talk to you today about the future of front end build tooling. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have heard at least Vite buzzing around. And if you were watching uh, NextConf, that launched that view, aired recently. You probably saw Next 13 and and Turbo Pack spoken about as well. Um, so we're here to to shed a little light on these subjects. Um, I want to take the direct approach and kind of give you the TLDR first. Um, today you should be using Beat. Um, Turbo Pack's an exciting entry into the space. It's got some cool things going on, but it's in alpha and uh, Vite's in stable release V3 um, and it's production ready. So in order to really understand and appreciate uh, the cool stuff that's in uh, build tooling like Vite, we really have to kind of understand where we've come from and what we have been doing um, for quite some time. So um, there was a world uh, where JavaScript didn't exist. Uh, and in that world, we got complete HTML documents uh, delivered by the server, and we didn't have much interactivity, um, just anchor tags and form requests that resulted in another request to the server and another entire uh, HTML document. Um, <clears throat> but then JS came on the scene. It was 1995, dinosaurs roamed the earth. Not those ones, these ones. And they were battling it out with these. So it was revolutionary for us because no longer did we have to make and fetch entire HTML documents. We could now manipulate the DOM on the, on the client side in the browser, um, which was a game changer for us. We imported uh, JavaScript files via script tags in our HTML and off we went. More than a decade passed and things started to turn into a little bit of a dumpster fire. Um, we started doing more and more things with JavaScript. Our JavaScript applications grew and became complex. And the big issue here was that when we imported JavaScript files, they were all imported into the global variable space within our application. Um, so the complexity became unmanageable. We knew that we needed some way to take these complex concerns and break them up into smaller concerns. We needed modules. <clears throat> So 2009, um, Node.js came to the rescue. Um, Node.js was a revolutionary uh, technology um, and it, for the first time, gave us the ability to execute JavaScript code outside of the environment of the browser. Um, it introduced a module system called CommonJS um, and it gave us what we desperately needed. Um, you'll see here on the screenshot um, an example of uh, how you, the syntax and how you would ex export something in common JS syntax. Um, <clears throat> it also introduced an NPM package manager and package ecosystem that allowed us to take our modules and, and package them up and share them. Um, early bundlers were also written at this time um, that would take, that understood the dependency graph and could take all of our code along with dependencies and create a single bundle for the client. For the purposes of this talk, it's also important to understand that Node.js is a runtime environment. Much like the JVM runtime allows Java code to be executed on a number of different platforms, so also does Node.js do the same for JavaScript. It's leveraging Chrome's, uh, or Google, Google Chrome's V8 uh, engine, written in C++ as the interpreter on the, on the server side. Um, and it was an exciting technology. It gave rise to the ability for JavaScript to be used in the back end as well as the front end. But um, more notably, it gave rise to bundlers like Webpack, Parcel, and Rollup. Um, and it gave us the ability to have uh, eventually more complex uh, bundling patterns, improving performance like code splitting and, and bundle chunking and cache busting. So it's 2015 and ECMAScript International uh, dropped a pretty revolutionary new standard, ES6, that got us all pretty excited. It introduced all kinds of new features like promises and arrow functions, mutable and immutable, immutable variable declarations with let and const and ESM or ECMAScript modules. Um, however, if history had taught us anything, it was that browser vendors were going to take a really long time, like probably years, 
before we ever saw these things implemented natively in the browser. And so that's when the community leveraged Node once again and came up with Babel. Uh, Babel was a new part of our build chain that introduced a technique called transpilation that could take our ES6 syntax and turn it into ES5 in the bundle for the client. Bundlers also took on more responsibility and supersets were even created like CoffeeScript and TypeScript. Um, and it was at this time that some of those new features were introduced like code splitting and bundle chunking. <clears throat> so let's take a look at Common JS and what it was actually doing and how it solved the problem of pollution in the global variable scope. Um, at evaluation time, these, uh, these modules would be nothing more than a function. So Node.js was actually taking the module exports and it was wrapping those modules in a function and that function would thereby have its own execution context and variable scope. Um, <clears throat> Syntax on the right is likely what you're more familiar with today if you're a front-end dev. This is the ESM syntax. Um, behind the scenes at this time, what was happening was our bundlers were taking our ESM syntax and turning them into common JS syntax. Um, so it really was no more than syntactical sugar at the time. However, the ESM spec called for these modules to be evaluated at parse time. So ESM is fundamentally in this way at odds a bit with CommonJS. ES modules can be transpiled down to CommonJS modules, but by the time a CommonJS module runs, ESM in theory is already, the time for ESM in theory has already passed, though the opposite is not true. <clears throat> no talk about build tooling would be complete without talking a little bit about the frameworks that depend upon them. So in the earlier days, around the time that ES6 was first dropped, we were seeing the emergence of reactive frameworks like React and Vue. Um, it was an exciting time. Um, it allowed us to do a lot of cool things, but there was a problem. The user experience wasn't ideal and could use some improvement. Um, a, a largely empty HTML document was received by the client on first request. If we were fancy, we were showing some loading UI. And behind the scenes, the browser was downloading all of our JS, executing it, and prepping it for first paint and interactivity. Today, we have a newer architecture that's emerging with frameworks like Nuxt and Next that are using a server to pre-render some of this HTML for the user. So the user actually has some content to consume um, on first request. Meanwhile, during that initial consumption, we're still downloading the JavaScript files, we're executing the JavaScript and, and prepping interactivity, providing a better experience for the user. So, since 2017, we have had support for native in-browser ES modules. Um, and more recently, uh, with the, the advent of Vite, that has really, uh, really been coming into view. So, introducing Vite, if you haven't heard about it. Um, it's pronounced Vite, it's French for fast, as Evan Yu has told me and Google Translate. Um, <laughs> uh, the first thing you're going to notice when you fire up a Vite project is it's really fast. Um, and one of the cool things that it's doing to achieve that speed is leveraging uh, ES modules in natively in browsers. So there, there is no, it's not doing bundle chunking or, or cache busting or anything like that. It, it, it is um, implementing your config and your options um, to keep it consistent with how it's going to be in production. Um, but it skips a lot of the complexities that took so much time in the build process. So that's how, that's one of the, the methodologies it's using to achieve its speed, um, which I'll show you in practice in a minute. So this diagram kind of just illustrates the, uh, what I was just talking to you about, that on development side, it's bundless. There is no bundle chain. Um, config and plugins are consistent. Um, you have HMR, uh, which is also very, very fast. On the production side, they're using Rollup under the hood. Um, and Rollup is providing all those features that we really need for our production environments. Um, advanced tree shaking, code splitting, minification, bundle chunking, cache busting, et cetera. Um, 
But it is a really salient point that um, the Vite team has put a lot of effort forth to keep the, that config and the plugins in, in dev land the same as they are in production so that you're not um, introducing weird bugs, having a different environment in, in both places. So the main features, um, and uh, the, the speed is the first thing that got me when I was first interacting with Vite. Um, the second thing was the NPM auto resolution and zero config. Um, it was my first introduction to like actually playing around with a zero config bundler. It's, it, it, so, and we'll get there in just a moment because I'm gonna show you. Um, <clears throat> other cool things it can do, um, it can actually deal with WebAssembly. Um, you can pull in Babel if you really need it for, for older browsers. Uh, you can work with web workers. Um, I would highly recommend that you, uh, you visit the features page here and, and take a look at, at what it can do. But another really cool thing is the testing library. They have a, a built-in uh, first-class citizen testing library, VTest, that's compatible with Jest. Um, and it has a really cool feature where it knows what tests need to be run and which ones don't. It's kind of like HMR for testing. So if any of you guys are like me and you've ever struggled with a Webpack config that looks anything like this, you're really going to appreciate what Vite does for you. Um, I don't know about you, but in my earlier days, um, one of the things I hated about starting up a new project was I, I worked in SaaS. And getting a SAS loader set up, tinkering with the regex for the SAS loader, like path resolution, uh, asset copying, like all these different configs um, that I had to deal with, I struggled with, uh, especially in the early days. And um, Vite is, is, is solving that problem. We're going to enter a world where people don't struggle with that anymore. Um, so your Vite config, I mean, while it does expose a, a lot of customization, uh, possible, you get full access to Rollup's uh, plugin repository, so it's very compatible um, and extensible uh, if you need it. But I don't really think that that's going to be the case uh, for for a lot of you know in a lot of cases. Um, so let me just show you real quick. So this is it's it's not running right now, but this is a little project that. I built for tomorrow's talk on Vue 3 and, and Pina and architectural patterns. It's also built using Vite. So this is the Vite project. And this is how fast Vite can start up. It's super fast. And the other thing that you're gonna notice, I'll kind of show you in practice here, is that if we are to, if we set our dev tools to all here we have a look at what's coming in we see all of our individual files being pulled in here here are the different view files native es modules right in our browser another cool thing so this is the this is the other this is the the jelly to the peanut butter of auto resolution right so this is it, it's the zero config part so right now my project's only just using vanilla CSS, right? Um, but I mentioned that I like SAS. So I install SAS. And I refactor my SAS file. Oh, CSS file, rather. Now I'm double checking main.js to make sure it's importing it. And, and it, it, <laughs> I missed the HMR. HMR was going to take care of it for me, but um, but I'm now using my SAS file, zero config. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I've dealt with this Webpack thing in the past, and this blew me away when I first started playing around with it. Um, so back to our talk. <clears throat> it's important to note that. Uh, ESM in the browser is not the only strategy that these new tool chains are using to achieve better performance. In addition to having server-side node uh, running uh, in our server, uh, we also have technologies like Go and Rust um, that are also being employed. 
Um, and this is where the ES build and SWC talk comes in. These are libraries that are in active development um, that not only um, tool chains like Vite and Turbo Pack are leveraging, but the lower level bundlers, um, Rollup, Parcel, Webpack, et cetera, also um, using these libraries to speed up their build chains. So it's important to, to think about um, Vite and Turbo Pack as another layer above what we've had previously. It's an, they're an abstraction. I mean, V is a, a, a loose replacement for Vue CLI. Um, and one of the cool things that this is gonna do for us is by abstracting away a lot of these com complexities, uh, they're decoupling the configurations from our applications in a, to a degree and kind of introducing more freedom for them to iterate quicker and, and continue to introduce more and more performance enhancements into the build chain. One little aside that I wanted to present to you guys is uh, if you're working on a project that's leveraging Webpack and uh, you feel like you can't get out, it's too big, um, there is still some hope to pull in some of this new performance. Um, there's a project called ES Build Loader, um, and it's a loader for Webpack. And under the hood, it's giving you JS TypeScript, um, JS minification. So it's taking, Golang is now taking over from what previously was JS um, in those responsibilities. Um, that it should drastically, especially if you have a big bundle, it should drastically speed up your build times. Okay, let's talk turbo pack. Um, let's first focus on the good. Um, it's important to note that turbo pack is not a clone of Vite. Um, turbo pack is taking a totally different architectural approach to the build chain. Um, instead of HMR uh, and it, not HMR, instead of a totally different dev environment than a production environment, um, they keep their environments the same and they use a technique that they call incremental building where they only build something once. Um, and not a whole lot's known about the, the underlayment of how this is all working, but um, what they've said is it, even granularity, even down to the function level, TurboPack is able to recognize, oh, you changed something that has to do with this function, I need to rebuild you, but nothing else. Um, so uh, in doing that, their idea or their hope is to flatten out the performance code. So more JavaScript in your project will not equal less performance uh, in your build chain because all that stuff has already been built so long as you haven't changed it. Um, and it's, a it's important to note, it's a technique that's also being employed, although it's a different technology, same kind of goal and technique is being employed by QuickJS. Um, so QuickJS is a, is a new framework on the scene and uh, it, it uses React-like syntax and uh, it has a competitor or I guess a, a similar framework to Next and Nux called QuickCity. So uh, definitely worth a, a look at some point. Um, so also important to note that uh, while TurboPack only currently supports Next.js 13 in the dev environment. Um, their goal is to make it a true successor to Webpack and to make it available to any kind of JavaScript project. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the bad. Um, doesn't support preprocessors. So we do live in a world where plain old CSS has come a long, long way. You know, we have all kinds of cool features um, supported natively now. Um, but I still, I, I, I still really enjoy um, writing SCSS and, and do leverage some of its features. So this was kind of a, a thing for me. Um, also doesn't natively support Tailwind. And I know Tailwind has kind of taken our world by storm over the last few years. And there's a lot of people that I know that, um, that enjoy using it. Um, and the third point is the biggest one. Uh, it's, in, it's in alpha. Uh, so don't really know exactly when Vercel will uh, and Tobias Coffer's team will um, release it uh, or a stable release, but you know I'm personally excited to see what they do. Um, uh, Tobias has a decade of experience uh, building and maintaining a build tool. Um, 
and Vercel is backing him and, and allowing him to pick and lead a team to build this tool. So I, I don't mean to diminish the potential that TurboPack um, has. I'm excited to see what they do. Um, but for today, um, I think that the launch could have been better and that comparing, um, they came out and they compared the speeds of TurboPack to Vite's speed, saying they're 10 to 20 times faster. And I feel it's a little unfair on, on the first, on the first hand uh, for an alpha project to be saying that to something that's in a stable V3 release. Um, on the second hand, uh, I think that this, this scalability curve that I was talking about previously, we only start to really see that in really large projects. If you go and you look at their doc site where they publish this information about the speed differentials, um, the lowest level that you can, that you can select is a thousand components. Like raise your hand if you've ever worked on a project with has a thousand components, like, um, or if your current project does, like, that's a lot of components, and I think it goes up to thirty thousand components. So that says to me that that Vercel is really targeting more enterprise class projects that have tons and tons of components. Um, so the other thing is that Vercel and, and TurboPack team stance on this, I feel, has has solidified. Veet, in a sense, um, as kind of the go-to uh, de facto standard right now in modern build tooling, just out of pure fact that um, they're targeting them. Um, it's also important to, to take a moment and look at the organizational landscape as well. Um, Vercel does not own or even run all of the projects that you see here on the Vercel side, but they are all very much important players within Vercel's ecosystem. Um, and for the purposes of Next.js, it's also important to understand that Vercel has a, a distinct business interest in you using their platform because they want to host you and they want to host all your cached data. Not a terrible thing that they're making a business model out of it, just something to know when you're planning your next project. Um, on the, the Vt and Vue and everything else side of the equation, it's very open, it's open source for a reason. And I put SWC on this side because the V team does have plans for incorporating the power of Rust and, and SWC as a library uh, as certain features are available that are interesting to them. Um, so important things to note. So the big question, can and should we use any of these tools today? Um, as you can see here from my graphic, um, Vite is usable in production by all of these different technologies and more. Um, so I would wager to guess that for most projects, the answer would be yes. Um, you can use this for your project. The, the only thing that I've run into in practical application migrating projects is you may sometimes have some dependency issues um, that you have to work out. Um, uh, when moving to Vite, but uh, it's well worth it because as application developers, we recognize the benefit of, of micro, uh, micro improvements in our efficiencies, like learning the key bindings in our IDE and, and how much time that can add up to in the course of a year. You know, how uh, TurboPack uh, during the next JS comp estimated that TurboPack, even in its alpha, has already saved the developers decades worth of build time. Um, Vite's been out since 2020. How much build time do you think Vite has saved developers? And how much time could it save you if your build chain in dev was 700 times faster than it is today? Um, or your CI pipeline was running a, a 100 times faster? The answer is probably a lot. Um, so uh, my encouragement to you, uh, all of that being said, is there's not a whole lot of risk in creating a sandbox for yourself in an existing project or even a new one um, that you're planning to create and giving beat a shot. Uh, I think that you'll be very pleasantly surprised as I was. Um, I, my first migration with it was a large e-commerce app in Laravel that I'd been working on for three years. And, had a lot of JS in it, and I was able to my and ha actually had two bundles, one for the admin side and one for the storefront side, and I was able to migrate my entire long-running project in in four hours or less. 
um, and deal with any dependency issues. So um, it's been really well worth it uh, for me. Uh, and I'll close with this. Most of uh, Evan Yu at Next uh, or at VeetConf uh, 2022 this year, he, he said, most developers will experience Veet through a framework, and that's true. Like, and it's been true for me for other revolutionary technologies. It hasn't been until uh, the exp I passively kind of stumbled onto the experience. Um, but my hope is uh, for everyone attending here today that uh, I've inspired you to go out and actively give Veet a shot and pull it into one of your projects and use it in the future. Thank you. <laughs>